Hi, hello, welcome, and welcome back to the Physionic Podcast. My name is Nicholas Verhoeven. I'm a PhD candidate in molecular medicine, and today's podcast episode is going to be one that I actually meant to cover, I think, back in March of this year, but it just got pushed to the side uh, because I had all these other topics that I wanted to cover, and uh, this is also going to be a really involved topic, to be honest with you, so it's probably going to be quite long. Um, but the topic, if you're interested, it actually comes out of a journal known as the New England Journal of Medicine, and it is to try to figure out what happens to our hormones as we undergo weight loss. So not just the hormones as we go from through weight loss, but actually one year later, uh, this these researchers ended up looking at what happens to our hormones as we try to maintain weight loss as well. So it's really, really interesting because they cover a, a series of different hormones. I'm, I'm going to be covering most of them. Uh, however, if I don't cover something, which I'm definitely not going to be covering everything in this paper, they, I, I, I went into the supplemental material as well. So a lot of the supplemental data and I created my own graphs and whatnot. So for uh, the ease of understanding, if you're, if you're watching the podcast. So I will have the paper linked, however, if uh, I don't end up covering something that you're interested in. Now, with that said, as usual, uh, what I end up doing for these podcasts is uh, it's going to be quite long form, so free form, so I'm not going get, to be getting to the point. But if you want to get to the point, then uh, you can jump to the conclusion sections where I will put everything together in a nice bow. But you will be missing out on some of the details that I'll be discussing as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in th through the study design, uh, which should be relatively straightforward. Then I'm going to go into the data. I'm actually going to show you if you're watching the podcast. I'm going to show you some of the data and interspersed between there, I'm also going to be showing you some of the physiological mechanisms uh, of these hormones. What do they do? And uh, that's actually going to help us understand the conclusions at the end because uh, these hormones have, it's, it's really a lot of different hormones that they end up discussing. As a matter of fact, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and list some of them. They looked at leptin, uh, cholesterol, cholecystokinin, that's always a tough one, CKK is the abbreviation, uh, peptide YY, insulin glucagon-like peptide, as well as uh, several others. And so this is going to be definitely endocrinology focused. It's going to be focused on the hormonal aspect of weight loss. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and, and jump straight into it uh, from here. So the study design, let me jump over with my notes here and my presentation. So the, the paper is called, uh, the original study is called Long-Term Persistence of Hormonal Ad Adaptations to Weight Loss. Okay, so with that, the study design was relatively simple. Uh, the researchers recruited men and postmenopausal women, and all of these individuals were at least overweight. Most of them were uh, obese. So overweight and obese. So certainly that changes if this is necessarily going to apply to uh, people that are normal weight and just trying to drop, let's say 10 pounds or, you know, 20 pounds, uh, you know, 10 kilograms, whatever it might be. Uh, but I would venture to guess that there would at least be relatively similar effects, but that is just an educated guess. Okay, so they recruited these individuals and then they placed them on a 500 calorie diet, which was predestined for them. It was created for them. They had a particular uh, set of foods that they were supposed to eat along with vegetables. Now, people usually are going to ask me, okay, well, what is the composition of this diet? No, it is not keto. It is not anything, any specific diet. It's just an incredibly low calorie diet, including carbohydrates. Uh, they were uh, it obviously had to contain protein and fats. And then on top of that, they had uh, to eat a little bit of vegetables on the side as well. So uh, highly restrictive, but not necessarily in any one macronutrient. Okay, so they were on this 500 calorie diet for eight weeks. And before they were put on this diet, they had their baseline measures measured, meaning different hormones, their body weight, blood lipid panels, all that stuff was measured before they were put on the diet. Then they were on the diet for eight weeks. And then after those eight weeks, 
if the individuals had lost 10% of their body weight, of their total body weight, they had lost 10%, then for two weeks, they were instructed with a dietitian to how to reintroduce foods that they were normally accustomed to eating and things like that. But they were taught how to reintroduce these foods while maintaining their weight. So whatever weight loss that they'd had, I just realized I misspelled calorie here. Uh, I guess it doesn't affect anybody listening. But if after they went through their dramatic weight loss, they of course then were promised, hey, we're going to teach you how to maintain that weight loss. So they were taught how to maintain that weight loss with the dietitians for two weeks. And then they were set on their way and they would meet with the dietitians as, as well as go into the research lab to do a few different measures. But the main measures were done after this two week period. So, so in total, that's 10 weeks where they were undergoing weight loss and then had a two week period with their, uh, their maintenance and they had measures taken there as well. So then we have a measure of the baseline before the 500 calorie diet, then after the weight loss period on the 500 calorie diet. Then for a year, they were left alone on this weight maintenance, just with what they were taught as well as some guidance along the way from dietitians. And then they also came into the research lab and then they had their measures taken again at the end of that one year. And that's what we're going to be examining. I'm most interested, most interested in the comparison of this one year mark compared to the 10 week mark. So at the at what I've labeled as the after weight loss period. Okay, so that's in in all that would lead to 62 weeks of this this study running. And like I mentioned, they do uh, blood measurements. They also do uh, body weight and all kinds of other measurements, as we'll see. Uh, again, I'm not going to be covering all of them, but I'm going to be covering a, a good amount, and we're going to get some interesting results out of this. Okay, so let's look at body weight first. So looking at body weight, there was after the eight weeks or the 10 weeks, again, this is just, I'm just generally calling this the after weight loss phase. If you want to call, if you want to cut that at eight weeks or the 10 weeks, doesn't matter. Uh, they saw dramatic weight loss. Is that a huge shock to you? No, it's not. If, if I didn't see weight loss, if I'm eating 500 calories and I don't see weight loss, <laughs> there will be hell to pay for for my metabolism because I would be so mad that uh, that I hadn't lost any weight, especially if I'm overweight and I'm eating 500 calories. That's torture. Anyway, they lost about. Of course, this is going to be variable. Uh, if you're watching the the uh, the podcast, you can see here I'm pointing out these these lines here. This is the what are called standard deviations, meaning that some people lost less weight, they were up here, and some people lost more weight, but the roughly they, they lost about eight kilograms of weight. Uh, that's little less than 20 pounds for anybody that's uh, using pounds. Okay, so they definitely lost weight though, that's the point. And then what happened after that? So that's not a revelation, but what's really interesting is what happens over the next 52 weeks, The over the next, uh, full year of them being on this maintenance. So at first, they're able to generally maintain their weight, uh, as in like they drop down to that maintenance weight that the researchers wanted them to stick to. And they were able to maintain that for, you know, eight, maybe 16 weeks, something along that Th those those lines and then it started to creep up and creep up and creep up and ultimately at the end of the year they still had w lost weight by comparison to this baseline measure so by comparison to where they started they were still far better off than where they were before however they were de they had gained some weight back after a year now, what we're interested in is what is going on to their hormones during this period right here. Okay, so weight loss gained a little bit of it back. Okay, so first we're going to discuss blood sugar. We're going to discuss insulin. We're going to dis discuss insulin resistance or insulin sensitivity. So 
if you're unfamiliar, I, I have a few graphics here. I, I'm not going to be doing graphics for every single hormone, but I will try to explain the hormones uh, to, to a degree so that you have some education on that as well. So uh, if you see glucose, I think I actually removed all the words glucose uh, and I, I just changed it to blood sugar. So blood sugar and glucose are synonymous. So you have sugar that's in your bloodstream. It has to be there. If it's not there, you're dead. So that's just a moot point. You have blood sugar that's in your bloodstream. And obviously when you eat, especially carbohydrates, this blood sugar accumulates. Now without insulin, and please bear with me if you are a person who knows quite a lot about this, because I realize that there are uh, technically blood sugar can get into the cells without insulin. But let's just for all for this purpose, let's just say that insulin is at least the primary way that blood sugar moves from the bloodstream, where it's essentially useless, right, uh, in terms of feeding our cells, uh, it actually needs to enter the cells to actually feed the cells. It's just like, uh, it's almost like having a cake uh, on your desk, but you're not allowed to eat it. That cake is useless. Uh, so that's the same thing with your bloodstream. The cake is in your bloodstream, but it actually needs to enter your mouth. So it needs to enter these cells. And insulin does that. So when we eat carbohydrates, especially carbohydrates, but even the other uh, macronutrients, our blood insulin levels or our blood sugar levels increase. And this ultimately stimulates the pancreas to release insulin. And then insulin is now in the bloodstream, which then binds all kinds of cells. I've in my diagram, I have muscle cells. It doesn't have to be muscle cells. It can be anything, any type of cell. And then once the insulin binds, that shuttles this glucose or this blood sugar out of the bloodstream into the muscles. Now, the, the, less, the least amount of insulin that you have in your bloodstream that allows the most amount of blood sugar into the muscle, into the cells, I should say, in general, that is that means you are highly insulin sensitive that means less insulin is needed to to shuttle more glucose or more blood sugar into uh, the cells that is a good state of being that is what typically healthy individuals are highly insulin sensitive okay so now let's look at these now he'll if <laughs> Again, if you are a person who has a science background, please forgive me for these graphs. I, I have created these myself. The values themselves are accurate to the data that is presented in the paper. I just created these kind of demonstrations so it's just easier on the eyes. Okay, so initially the blood sugar levels were 5.9 millimoles or 5.9 millimolar, which is a certain concentration in the bloodstream. Then, and this is fasting levels, then after the weight loss, they did the exact same experiment where they did fasting levels and they measured the, the blood sugar levels and they found that the individuals had a statistically significant decrease in blood sugar. Okay, so that's not a huge shock because generally weight loss leads to a reduction in blood sugar. However, after one year, their blood sugar levels were exactly the same as they were at baseline. So their blood sugar levels returned back to where they were before, so higher at 5.9 millimoles. Okay, so blood sugar seems to see a benefit from weight loss, but it rebounds after a year. Even and every time I want you to I want you to keep this in mind. This is really important. Every time I'm talking about this after one year mark, keep in mind that they did not regain all of their weight back. They were still statistically significantly lower in weight than where they were at the baseline measure. And yet their blood sugar is the same as it was at baseline. Keep that in mind because that's going to be important throughout the rest of the podcast. Okay, now looking at insulin. Now insulin levels here, we find that uh, they were at 17.7, and I didn't list the units because I, I, the units just don't matter that much in terms of like trying to teach this to, 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 to you. If, if, you're, if you have a science background, then of course, check out the, the paper itself. So it's at 17.7 units, that's what I'm going to call it. And 
then I think it's actually micromolar or something like that. It's significantly lower than blood sugar levels. So 17.7. Then after the weight loss, it dropped down to 9.1. Now keep in mind, remember what I said, that if you have lower insulin levels and you're shuttling in more glucose, that means that's a good thing. That means you're more insulin sensitive. So it dramatically decreased. It almost halved with the weight loss, which is fantastic. Then after the year, it did rebound to about 13.8. So right about the middle mark between the right after weight loss and the baseline measures. So this tells us some pretty interesting information because the blood sugar levels rebounded back to where they were and the insulin levels kind of half rebounded back to where they were. However, uh, the measures, which I actually don't have uh, a graphic for, but they do list these measures as well, that the, uh, they had measures for insulin resistance specifically. So not just looking at insulin, not just looking at blood sugar, but they did a calculation of, for uh, insulin resistance. And they found that insulin resistance, from what I recall, was reduced uh, from the even at the one-year mark. So there was still a benefit even with a small amount of weight regain, that there was still a benefit in insulin resistance, meaning that they were still pretty sensitive to insulin, which is great. Okay, so now let's move on to a few other hormones. Now we're getting away from the blood sugar, we're getting away from the insulin, we're getting away from the insulin sensitivity. And we're going to look at a lot of these hunger hormones, but they actually have other effects as well. Uh, certainly, I mean, of course, hormones have effects in all kinds of different ways. And I'm, I'm going to be detailing a few that are probably some that you've never heard of before, and some that you may have heard of, but you've only heard about it in one way. I'm going to be explaining a few other ways that it affects your body. Okay, let's move on to leptin. Leptin is typically secreted from your fat cells. It is a good kind of energetic sensor. Uh, it senses if your energy consumption, as in your caloric consumption, has, has decreased to the point where you're losing body fat. Because as you lose body fat, then uh, your leptin levels start to decrease. And it happens pretty quickly. Um, so leptin levels decrease and leptin typically binds a section of the brain known as the hypothalamus. And when it does that, it, it affects a series of different cells, uh, different neurons. Uh, now, if you are familiar with my content, I have hunger, I have some content on hunger hormones and uh, the how hunger is stimulated and how leptin affects hunger hormones. So I'm sure you've watched that because you've been subscribed to Physionic and, and love learning about physiology. <laughs> Uh, so I doubt I need to explain this, but for those of you that that are new that may not have seen that video uh, or that that heard that podcast, then uh, I will explain it again. So leptin is typically in high concentrations. So if you're maintaining your weight or you're gaining weight, leptin is in high concentrations and it will bind the hypothalamus and you will get the release of something called melanocyte stimulating hormone which then impedes hunger. It reduces hunger. However, in the circumstance we're talking about, these people had significant weight loss, right? So they most certainly lost a significant amount of body fat. As such, their leptin levels likely, we'll see, but likely decreased and therefore reduced the break on hunger thereby increasing hunger. We will be discussing hunger as well. So hold on, hold on to your pants. Now, not only does leptin get secreted, again, if somebody knows more about this uh, hormone, please don't jump all over me by saying, well, it's not just secreted from fat cells. Yes, I know. It's secreted from the stomach as well as other areas, but the primary tissue that it's released from is fat. Okay, so leptin levels. What we find is that leptin levels are really quite elevated, 32.6 units for the baseline, so before weight loss, and then after weight loss, it just sinks. It plummets to almost a third of uh, the baseline levels. It drops to 11.5 units. And then after one year, we see 
a sort of predictable, but understandable, at least understandable, increase back up to 20.7 units. So leptin levels then increase back up. This, this makes a lot of sense to me because we're seeing this slow increase in body weight. So what do you think is happening here? <laughs> Most likely these people are starting to consume a little bit more than what they're supposed to. For a while they were sticking with it and then they, they were like, well, you know, I could have a little snack here. Or, you know, I, I, I want to have a, a guy's night. I'm just going to have a, a bag of Doritos or whatever it might be. And, it, you know, that starts to add up and it builds up, which... Uh, is understandable. And we're going to understand really why. Okay, so leptin starts to increase. Okay, two more hormones. Yes, I do have uh, graphics for this as well. So two more hormones are ghrelin and peptide YY. Again, two hormones that I've discussed in the past on the Physionic channel. So please go ahead and check that out if you'd like uh, more information on these hormones. But uh, if you're new here, I'm sure you haven't seen those videos, so I'll explain it as well. So ghrelin is released from your stomach and peptide YY, and both of these, and peptide YY comes from your intestines, and both of these have an effect on your brain, the exact same section that leptin has an effect. So you have a, a series of different hormones that affect your hunger, and it does it through antithetic ways. So peptide YY, when you consume food, tends to decrease your hunger. So it has a, a different effect from what leptin, well, leptin and peptide YY do this, roughly the same thing in this regard, but obviously decreases in both would lead to increases in hunger, right? So, but ghrelin on the other hand is the exact opposite. So increases in ghrelin, tend to increase hunger. So again, they bind the hypothalamus and do and have this effect through a melanocyte stimulating hormone. Technically, there's other mediators as well, like AGRP and uh, neuropeptide Y, but uh, we're not gonna go into that. So it increases hunger for ghrelin. And also something that I should point out that I think is important is that these hormones work in, in, in different times. So CKK, for example, which is the one that I had struggled to, uh, to say earlier, uh, cholecystokinin is a short-term hormone. It kind of gets released uh, while you're eating, but it tends to have uh, less than, it, it doesn't last a very long time. On the other hand, peptide YY, from what I remember from my review, is that it can last uh, like six hours, something like that. So quite a long time. And ghrelin also uh, tends to be kind of in the middle, uh, not released for a really long time, but also not super short like CKK. So that's something to keep in mind as well, that these hormones, although they may play on similar areas of the body and similar uh, similar areas of the brain have similar effects, uh, their, their kinetics, the, the speed by which they're released and that they're degraded and, and the effect that they have is uh, the, the amount of effect, the effect size can vary from hormone to hormone. Okay, I'll get off my uh, step stool and let's go ahead and discuss ghrelin. So ghrelin levels, if you're well-fed, typically is low right? Because ghrelin stimulates hunger. So baseline levels, as predicted, are quite low at 127 units. And then after weight loss, there was a, an increase to 184 units. So that makes sense. If you're, <laughs> like I said, if I'm eating 500 calories and I'm not losing weight, I'm going to be angry because I, uh, I am suffering through these hormones. These hormones uh, are increasing my hunger. I'm becoming ravenous. Uh, I would actually eat broccoli at this point. So 184 is quite the increase. But then after one year, it drops to about 152. And from what I remember, let me uh, check with my notes here. Yes, um, it started to reduce back. So we've got, I believe we still have elevated levels of ghrelin. Uh, after the one year mark, but it's certainly much lower than after the, uh, the weight loss phase. However, let's look at peptide YY. So peptide YY is decreased after weight loss. So it's high at baseline because again, it reduces hunger as the antithetic effect. 
And so 71.7 units at baseline, and then after weight loss, it's 54 units. And then, really interestingly, after one year, it basically doesn't change. It just stays down. It's still at 54.5 units. So it's essentially the exact same as uh, 52 weeks earlier when they were, they were at their lowest weight. So this right here is super interesting because uh, a lot of these other hormones are starting, you know, they're, they're, the people have lost some weight, okay, but they've, they've regained a little bit of it, and usually these hormones are kind of in the middle. They come back to rebound in the middle, but peptide YY does not seem to have that effect. It seems to stay down. It seems to stay uh, incapacitated. Okay, so in terms of now, this is that's what I've got in terms of like actual data, but I will be explaining some more data. I'll be explaining. I, I just don't want this whole podcast to ju you just be looking if you're watching the podcast for you just look at graphs that I've created shoddily. Um, okay, so some of the other hormones that they, they looked at as well were a glucagon-like peptide. And GLP is one that is secreted from the intestines and will affect the pancreas. So we talked about the pancreas earlier because the pancreas is what releases insulin levels. So GLP will actually stimulate the release of insulin. So what would you imagine if insulin levels are low, what would you imagine happened to GLP after weight loss? If you said that it decreased, you'd be right. Uh, because that's exactly what happened. So glucagon-like peptide was reduced with weight loss, and there was a rebound with partial weight gain, as we saw with uh, insulin as well. Um, also, GLP reduces appetite and also uh, glucagon release. Glucagon is what affects blood sugar levels uh, in the bloodstream. Another protein, another hormone, is amylin. So amylin is also released with uh, insulin. And it actually has an effect on glucagon secretion. So it reduces glucagon secretion. Because if you have high blood sugar levels and you have insulin being secreted to remove that blood sugar, you don't want glucagon around telling the liver to be producing sugar because there's no point. There's, there's already a ton of sugar around. So amylin will go and inhibit the release of glucagon and glucagon coming from the pancreas as well. So you've got pancreas releasing insulin, but inhibiting its other side. So it's like, it's like evil twin uh, inhibiting glucagon. Okay, so, and also another effect that amylin has is that it delays gastric emptying. So it maintains food in the stomach for longer and then uh, releases it into the intestines. That's what gastric emptying means, as well as increasing satiety. All this makes sense uh, because it's secreted with insulin. So it tends to, to you, the assumption here is that you are uh, consuming large amounts of food. So you are not in a state where you need to be, uh, could, you need this drive to be eating more food. No, so amylin was reduced by almost half with the weight loss and then there was a partial rebound, but it was still significantly lowered uh, by comparison. So this is, again, another hormone that starts to creep up just with the weight loss in association with the weight loss. And finally, CCK, I said CKK, I think, earlier. CCK, uh, cholecystokinin, uh, is a hormone that is implicated in hunger, satiety, but it also improves digestion. So it slows the gastric uh, emptying as well as the production of bile from the liver. And that's especially important for fat metabolism. Maybe not metabolism necessarily. Well, I guess, yeah, you could say metabolism as well. So the breakdown of fat molecules get uh, moved into bile and bile has a, a specific role in that. Um, so it also increases a sense of fullness uh, while you're eating specifically, and that, that's what I mentioned earlier. So it's a short effect, but it has an effect while you're eating. So how did weight loss actually affect that hormone? Well, there's a drop in CCK with the weight loss, which makes sense. That means that when you're, let's say, let's say 
let's just take this scenario where th- you are uh, you're eating your normal diet, you're maintaining your weight, or you're even gaining weight. Uh, the CCK and you're eating a let's say one meal in an in isolation, one meal of 600 calories, something like that, and it's the same composition. You've got fats, proteins, uh, carbohydrates. Well, CCK, if you consume it, if you consume that food, CCK will increase substantially and will inhibit your want to to eat more food. However, let's take the same exact scenario, but in this case, you've been depriving yourself of food for a while and you eat the exact same meal, the exact same composition, the exact same amount, CCK levels will be not as elevated from that meal, meaning that you will then experience a want for more foods uh, over time. Again, this is short, this is short duration. Okay, so CCK levels were dropped with weight loss and then rebound back up to normal with the uh, partial weight regain. So this one tends to to rebound back up to normal, but the more longstanding effects with like the peptide YY, we didn't see that rebound. So really interesting. Now, they also measured hunger, fullness, and the urge to eat, which are very similar to to one another. So hunger was increased with dieting. My mind is blown that people that are eating 500 calories for eight weeks are hungry. I'm blown away. This truly, I need to get my PhD to to be able to figure that one out. (laughs) Uh, But then decrease back to non-significance after partial weight regain. So even though they didn't go up to their full, like back up to their baseline weight, their hunger levels did decrease back down to normal levels after a little bit of weight regain, which is pretty interesting. It's pretty remarkable. Um, and I have a note here. These are notes from March. So I'm, I'm, I'm just noticing... Uh, I did remember that looking at the effect size, so the actual uh, amount of, uh, of difference between one condition and another condition, I, I said that it seems laughable that this is non-significant. So maybe I didn't believe the data. Maybe uh, the, in statistics, um, how do I explain this? The, if you don't have enough subjects, if you don't have enough participants, maybe you don't have enough power in your analysis, meaning that you're not able to tease out differences as easily. So the fact that there was no difference in hunger, it seems like according to old me, uh, which I believe old me quite, quite readily, uh, it seems that that was laughable. So ha, apparently hunger uh, was not different after the uh, f- full year compared to baseline, but I apparently don't believe that. So take that as you will. Okay, so now moving on to fullness. Fullness decreased with weight loss, but not significantly. Uh, And it did significantly decrease after a year, which I put a note of, that's really odd. And that is really odd, right? Uh, So fullness decreased with weight loss, but apparently not tremendously. And then it decreased more after the year strange effect. If you have a theory as to why that might be the case, uh, comment. I'd love, I'd honestly love to to hear your thoughts. Uh, Urge to eat. So the final metric that they looked at was the urge to eat. So they increased with weight loss, which increased with weight loss. Again, not a huge shock. Uh, And then although it dropped some after a year. So this seems to, and it, but it's still elevated after a full year. So not quite to the level of the, the weight loss, the urge to eat, the, the drive to eat is really high after weight loss, but after some weight regain, uh, that dampens some, which makes sense. It makes, it's totally in line with a lot of the uh, hormones that we were looking at where we see a partial uh, recovery. Okay, so that was a lot of information. I have not covered all of it, but that's where I'm going to stop it, meaning that I'm going to jump into the conclusions and the takeaways from this and allow me to, to read off of what I wrote here. So weight loss leads to mass changes in hormonal levels like leptin, peptide YY, glucagon-like peptide, amylin, insulin, and cholecystokinin, CCK, which I initially said was CKK. It's wrong. 
However, and that's, again, not a huge shock to think that your hormones are going to change if you, start, if you just start shedding body fat. Of course, that's going to be the, 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 the fact. So I, I don't want any snarky comments of like, this seems obvious. It's like, yeah, well, you need science to actually show the data. Uh, you can't just assume these things of like, oh, well, that's just obvious. Like some things that are obvious uh, turned out to be not so obvious once you start getting into some of the details, but I digress. However, one year later, with partial regain of weight, and that's important, remember one year, it wasn't a full regain of weight, just partial. Some hormones remain unchanged or remain changed, which was the prime example was peptide YY. Um, with weight loss, so insulin, leptin, amylin, both of those had partial uh, recovery, but not full, while other hormones rebounded back to their normal levels, uh, like ghrelin, uh, GLP, CCK, and interestingly, hunger measures were questionable. And that's where it's kind of that oddity that uh, if you have, especially on fullness, that was the one that really got me in the, my disbelief in the hunger uh, measure. Interestingly, hunger measures were qu questionable with a seemingly increased levels after one year, which isn't too shocking, and fullness was still not back to its normal levels. Uh, although desire to eat had normalized some, okay, so ac across those three measures. So these results might lead to a conclusion that certain hormones are resistant to change, while others are more flexible and willing to normalize. These mixed results on the urge to eat and hunger might indicate that hormones that do not return back to normal may be responsible for the increased hunger sensation. However, there may be other mechanisms that they didn't end up testing which is always true of every single study. That's why we need many studies on a particular, just a single sliver of a topic. Uh, something as simple as like weight loss and hormonal changes, because there are more hormones than are just listed in this paper, of course. So like we, we saw, some hormones tend to rebound very well and associate very well with weight loss and weight regain, and even partial weight regain will jump it right back up to normal where it was before, which is great. That means that there's no real set point for them. Um, however, other hormones tend to have a partial rebound that's very closely associated with weight loss or weight regain again. And that might indicate that there might be a set point that's kind of based off of where you're going to keep your body weight. And then you have other hormones that just seem to be completely unresponsive. And just once they're dampened, they just stay dampened. And maybe eventually they might creep back up. Uh, but that is clearly not the case from just partial weight regain. So what this teaches us is that partial weight regain may be easier then no weight regain. So that might be something to keep in mind. Uh, but ultimately, you have hormones that are fighting against you, even if some hormones have, re have returned back to your, to your side. So treasonous hormones there are. Okay, well, hopefully you got some information out of this. I really hope so. If you did, uh, smash the like button, smash the subscribe button. And uh, share if you if you would, I would really appreciate it. I'm really trying to grow physionic, and uh, it's 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 been arduous. And with that, I hope to have the pleasure of speaking with you in the future, and I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.